Welcome everybody to the QLOC Professional Development Scholarship webinar. Uh, my name is Rachel, I'm the Executive Officer for QLOC and I'll be your host this afternoon. In keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional owner of the lands where QT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. I wish to pay respects to their elders, past, present and future and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QT community. I would also like to extend this acknowledgement to all the places on which all webinar participants stand today. I should have started that by saying that I'm based at QT at Gardens Point in Brisbane. So today we've got uh, two recipients of the QLOC Professional Development Scholarship, um, which has been running since 2017. Um, the latest round uh, for professional development occurring in the first part of 2019 will close on the 23rd of November uh, in another couple of weeks. So if you're thinking about it, um, get organised because um, we're keen to see all those applications come through. So today I've got Sam Searle from Griffith University and Jackie Walston Holmes from Southern Cross University. Um, so Sam, you are going to go first. Excellent. Um, hi everyone and welcome to the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to get my slides up. Ooh. Okay. Excellent. And we'll get started. So, um, so thanks to QLOC, I was able to um, go to the Software Licensing and Asset Management um, or SLAM conference, which was on in October um, this year. This annual event is in its sixth year and it's run by the University Software Licensing Community, which is um, one of the communities of practice under the umbrella of the Council of Australasian Directors of IT or CORDIT. Um, it was quite a small event, but it had a really diverse range of attendees. Um, there were procurement specialists, IT staff, finance people, um, as well as the vendors of various software asset management solutions and services. Um, I was definitely the only librarian there, but I was made to feel very welcome. And I wasn't really the only person who was new to the SLAM event. There were quite a lot of people who were attending for the first time, and I think the newest person had only sat in their job 10 days before the conference. Um, it was a two-day program, and it was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, they had some keynotes covering some general IT trends um, in higher education. Also some case studies from universities um, and some vendor sessions covering product news, as well as giving updates on where some of the bigger software um, licensing negotiations and higher education were at. And the biggest one of those um, is the all of sector deal with Microsoft that's currently being negotiated by Quarter. So um, you might be thinking why would you want to go to this event as a librarian? Um, well, I had a few reasons for wanting to go. I guess most of our services rely on some kind of software, and I think there's a lot of scope to improve what we do in this area. So Cole's doing a really outstanding job in terms of consortial fields for electronic resources, but software hasn't been um, so much of a focus. And that even boils down to the information that's captured and things like the call statistics. So, there's quite granular information about library resource budgets that we can use for um, benchmarking, but um, software licensing costs are bundled up with a whole bunch of other expenses. 
So we don't even really know how much we're spending on software licensing as well as maintenance and support contracts. Um, I could, you know, just as a ballpark figure, I'm sure it would be um, well over $10 million. That's possibly even 15 or $20 million across all the university libraries. But we just don't know because we're not collecting that data. Um, so in terms of key professional takeaways from the event, um, I was actually really surprised to note how many similarities there were in the roles and the, the organisational context and issues that people who are managing software licensing um, have with people managing libraries. So I'll just give you a few examples of that. So basically both those groups are providing resources or tools to staff and students that are absolutely essential to supporting the core business um, of education, research and admin that all of our organisations are involved in. Um, both of those groups are perceived as being cost centres and so there was a lot of talk at the conference about how software asset management groups had to demonstrate their value to senior stakeholders and that sounded very familiar. Um, software specialists have to ensure that the university is complying with legal and contractual obligations. So there was a lot of concern about um, people accessing what they called shadow IT, by which they meant kind of unlicensed um, software. And they had very similar concerns to what libraries have around um, use of scholarly materials that might be breaching copyright and publisher agreements. Um, both of those groups manage portfolios of information assets, if you like, that have complex access management requirements. So um, the kinds of issues that libraries have in terms of providing resources and services to groups like alumni, adjunct academic staff and industry affiliates are very similar to um, things that the people managing software are going through. Um, and the other big similarity was really that both groups are dealing with similar market conditions and vendor practices. They're also concerned about situations where there's only one or a very limited number of suppliers of various um, software products and services. They're concerned about unsustainable pricing um, and also about deliberately opaque licensing terms and conditions and what that means for people trying to, to manage this. Uh, my second takeaway uh, professionally was that um, just as we use um, usage statistics for e-resources, we can use usage statistics for software to really drive our decision making, inform our negotiations with vendors and also look um, to saving money. So Slam introduced me to this really interesting concept of license optimization um, through some of the case studies that were presented and I'll come back to that later in this presentation. Um, I guess it's probably pretty obvious that if we've got all these similarities with this group, I guess um, I'm starting to think we should be expanding our informal networks and making sure that we're having conversations with our colleagues that deal with software licensing. And I actually think because of um, the dealings that we have with vendors that we've got a lot um, to contribute to building best practice across the organisation as a whole. Um, this one's kind of more of an observation uh, and less of a takeaway, but um, the crowd at this conference were a lot more confrontational with some of their vendors than I've actually seen in any of our library forums. So um, I'm a big believer in win-win negotiations. Um, I'm trying to have kind of respectful dialogues with vendors, but I did also come away from SLAM thinking that maybe um, librarians are just a bit too nice for our own good in some of these um, negotiations with our vendors. Um, in terms of a couple of key personal takeaways, um, I guess my career path has been a bit unorthodox and the boundaries between the library profession and other types of professional staff in higher education has always been a little bit blurry for me. Um, I've provided a research support from a computer science department, I've provided data management support within a library, I've been the change manager on a research storage project and an IT infrastructure team. Um, but all that time I still consider myself to be very much a librarian. Um, 
I've been in the library system space for a while now and I probably spend as much of my time talking to software vendors and solution architects and cyber security specialists and software licensing people um, as I do talking to other people in the library. But um, I still sometimes have felt a bit of a fraud in the IT space and wondered where all of this really might be leading in the future. Um, I guess going to SLAM is part of a process that I've been going through over time. I've come to realise that I really need to embrace that dual role as both a qualified librarian and a certified IT service manager and kind of getting to grips with the fact that that's not only okay, but it's actually very useful for the library to have people um, who can bridge that gap and it's going to help us with our position in the organisation. Um, attending this event really brought home for me um, the need for all library staff dealing with vendors to have good negotiation skills. And um, I'm really lucky that my employer has previously um, invested in my professional development through paying for me to go to the core negotiation and influencing workshop. Um, and that was an excellent basis for the kinds of discussions needed for managing software assets. Um, and I can't really imagine doing nearly a good, as good a job on this if I had not received that training. So I would really recommend that to anyone that does need to deal with vendors. I guess though I'm starting to realise that that call training really only covers the process once you're in negotiations with a vendor and I'm realising that there's a bit of a skills gap in many libraries and the earlier step in the process which is really around procurement and getting to the, the stage of the contract. Um, I think we uh, often handing over responsibility for the design of procurement to other parts of the organisation such as maybe finance or a project management office and I think we might be missing out on more creative and flexible approaches to procurement because we don't simply don't know enough about it. Um, a lot of library systems procurement seems to come about through a full tender process so that requires really exhaustive work beforehand on requirements gathering and scoping project and getting a big budget lined up. Um, but at the SLAM community um, their members were talking about more open and more early approaches to mark up through more requests for information processes. So identifying vendors that you could work with as a strategic partner, maybe even before you have a project budget or a project proposal even in place. Um, and they're also talking about really the pointlessness of full tender process when you're in a markup with very few options available. So I just want to say I'm not suggesting that we don't comply with our um, organisation's procurement guidelines, but I think that we need to really fully understand the complexity in the area so that we're not actually being railroaded into things, um, that we do understand that there might be other options available to us that we might want to explore. So in terms of application to my work, um, there was a pretty immediate chance to put some of um, what I learned into practice. So I mentioned earlier that SLAM introduced me to the concept of license optimization. And so on returning to work, I checked with my team about concurrent license usage data for one of our software products. Um, and this actually identified some pretty significant um, cost savings that we might be able to be achieved. So it turned out that we could actually probably have about 30% fewer user licenses um, than what we had. And that would have very little impact except during some quite high peaks. And we thought that those high peaks could actually probably be managed through some configuration changes, like reducing um, the length before people were getting a timeout. Um, and so $10,000 might not sound like much, but if you're going multiple products, multiple years over all of our organisations, it's potentially quite a lot of money that we might be missing out on by not looking at the usage of those licences. Um, in terms of applications in my library, um, I'll just go back to the example I just mentioned because unfortunately, although we did identify some cost savings um, 
that would be achievable through reducing the number of licenses. It turned out that we'd actually entered into a three-year contract with that vendor that will probably not allow us to actually do that. So we've basically locked ourselves into an agreement that doesn't let us reduce license numbers once contracts in place. Um, so that's been a pretty hard lesson to learn, but I guess for the future, um, I'm now aware that I need to negotiate an annual change in license numbers as part of the renewal process. And um, the software licensing people do this all the time and they've even got their own bit of jargon for it, which is called, like, called true up and true down, which means going up or down to reflect the true nature of the usage, not what you thought you might have needed three years ago. Um, another thing that um, will be important at my workplace, I uh, was not really expecting to hear that some universities are really considering challenging their vendors to justify the value of support and maintenance costs that are being paid on top of software licensing. Um, a number of the participants at SLAM were really critical of the value for money that those annual agreements um, are providing. Um, so I'll definitely be talking to our software licensing support team about what alternative models they're actually exploring with vendors of non-library software. And in the library space, we do already have one supplier who operates under more of a pay-as-you-go support credits arrangement, and that's giving us total transparency about the time and cost for every support job that we're logging to that vendor. Um, so it'd be interesting to see whether that might be something we could roll out further. Um, although, to be honest, I'm not actually optimistic that that's going to be possible in the short term. I really believe that our vendors will be totally reluctant to give up that annual support model because that's one of their biggest cash cows. Um, but definitely something to think about for future procurement processes and renewal negotiations. Um, so just finally moving on to some applications in Cuba, I guess the, it's raised a lot of questions for me. Um, I think it would be possible for the Cuba ICT working group to consider putting some questions about software licensing costs into the annual survey that is done. Obviously that would need to be um, worded in a way that confidentiality clauses and contracts weren't being breached, but I think if we could come up with a way to do that, that would be very useful. Um, I think there's a lot of potential to run some joint activities between the QLOC ICT working group and the um, emerging quarter library IT community. So I think this would be a really interesting discussion to take forward um, regionally and, and nationally. Um, I think there's also a couple of questions I have around the world that, that QLOC representatives might be able to play with and call to progress things in this space. Um, many of you may be aware that um, Hall is expanding um, its procurement capacity. There's um, a position um, coming out in that area and I guess I'm interested in whether if the procurement capacity is expanding is there room to incorporate more software licensing and not just electronic resources within the scope of course activities. Um, and I guess there's, you know, there's a lot of software procurement expertise um, in quarter that um, I don't think the call members or the QWAP members are really um, taking advantage of. So it would be great um, to have those um, issues kind of raised at that level. And I guess to have a, a bit more kind of collaboration between the libraries and the IT to, um, to see whether we can make some progress on some of these thorny issues. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you very much to QLOP for the opportunity to attend. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question um, to Sam, you can use the chat, uh, the chat panel. Um, please do so. Um, when we are recording this uh, uh, webinar, so when I send out the link to everybody, I'll also include um, Sam's link to her blog. Um, so if you've got any sort of deeper questions, you could certainly contact Sam. And Sam works at Griffith Uni, so too easy to find.
Um, Sam, I wanted to find out if is this an annual event that they hold? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it is an annual event and um, it's been growing quite a bit, they said. So even though it was only 50 people, that it's been growing every year that they've held it. And um, I think it's usually in Brisbane, so it's quite okay. accessible for QLOC, um, people at QLOC organisations to attend. And it's very reasonably priced for, for two days of professional development. Yeah, and do you think that um, you would go again or like in the next 12 months or do you think you'd wait and go another time? Yeah, I think I'd probably wait, but I would definitely go back. It was a really interesting group of people and there were just so so many similarities that I wasn't expecting um, in yeah. terms of the issues that they're dealing with, definitely. Um, so you may have already talked about this, so sorry if I'm asking you to repeat something, but uh, <laughs> when you went attended, did you feel like you were a complete fish out of water uh, and you shouldn't be there? Or did you just sort of go, well, we'll just... Like, did anyone care? Did no one seem to care? No, they were really, really nice. I mean, they were a bit intrigued, I think, as to why you would be there. But then when I sort of explained that, you know, libraries do use quite a bit of software, and but we're also dealing with vendors about all these big databases, I think there was a lot of common ground there, definitely. Great. Can you see the chats? Um, because as I can read out the question if you can't. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, well, that's from Jackie. Um, yeah, um, so Jackie's asking what what was the main software that was discussed, and is there software being used by all universities? Um, so it was a real mix, Jackie. It sort of some of them were quite big corporate products like the Microsoft Office Suite, which obviously a lot of people were. Um, using that, if not everybody. Um, there was quite a focus on specific tools for doing software asset management. So that was a little niche that the people at this event were obviously very focused on, but it also kind of went um, across a range of other things in the case studies. People were looking at um, virtual student desktop environment, um, I'm just trying to think of some other examples. Quartet is really dealing with quite a lot of um, software licensing issues and they've got some good information on the Quartet website where you can see the different software that they're interested in. It's very broad. All right, if there's any other questions, please pop them up now. Um, otherwise we'll... Um, uh, we might move on to Jackie. Thank you so much, Sam. That's very Thank interesting. Um, very different uh, to the usual conference um, presentation that we receive. Um, so Jackie Walstenholm from Southern Cross University has been um, going through some arms accreditation process over the most of the year. Um, so Jackie, I'll hand it over to you to explain all of that. Thanks, Rachel. Um, just to say Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, um, first of all, I just wanted to say that this has been a super busy year for me because I've changed jobs and moved from JCU to Southern Cross University. And um, my QOP PD scholarship has bridged this time. So I'd like to thank and acknowledge QLOP for my PD scholarship from two perspectives. One is firstly, the scholarship funded my registration fees. And also it, uh, having the scholarship really inspired me to um, persist with the program that I've been working on, which has taken much of this year. And so thanks to QLOG. So what I've been doing is a little bit different. Um, and so I'm gonna first explain what ARMS 
is uh, the Australasian Research Management Society. And then I'm going to talk about my experience in doing one of their programs. And in case I inspire you to do the program, this link is to the page about the accreditation program on the ARMS website. And so first of all, what is ARMS? ARMS is an acronym for the Australasian Research Management Society. And it's dedicated to the development of research management professionals. As stated on the ARMS website, ARMS advances the research enterprise through professional collaborations, presentations, annual conferences and publications, and also through supporting international best practice for research management and through accreditation programs which recognise research management as a profession. And it's one of these programs that I'm going to tell you about today. So ARMS members come from universities, government, health research institutes and research organisations. Two examples of health research institutes that you may have heard of are the Menzies Institute for Medical Research and the QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute. And an example of a research institution that I'm sure you've all heard of is CSIRO. This diversity of membership really added to the discussions during our workshops. And <clears throat> participants in the workshops were mostly from universities, but were also from these other categories of government, health research, and um, bigger research institutions. And the examples we learn about were taken from each of these member categories. So I now feel that I've got a greater understanding of how research is done and how it's used across this range of organisations. So the activity that I've been doing is um, so, um, several modules within the program. The first module was titled Legislation as it re affects research in Australia. And the facilitator of this workshop was Anne-Marie Jackson, who's the manager of research and ethics at USQ. And this workshop was held at UQ, so had a lot of UQ staff attending. The second workshop was titled Research Information and Analytics. And the facilitator was Simon Brennan, who's the director of research at the University of Adelaide. And this workshop was held at JCU, and so had a lot of JCU people attending. And the third workshop was titled Working with Industry, and it was facilitated by Kavitha Chandra Shekara, and she's the sector manager of business design and urban living at RMIT University. This workshop was held at Griffith University, um, so I expected lots of um, staff from Griffith to be attending, but it was actually mainly UQ staff who attended that one. Um, so I chose workshops that were of most interest to me and really liked the way that this included so many different universities. The broad range of workshop workplaces and roles of the presenters and participants provided varied discussion about the types of issues encountered in research offices and how the research office staff respond to these issues. I think this was particularly useful for me coming from a relatively small university. But participants from larger universities like UQ have also said that they find the workshops really useful for meeting staff from different sections within their own university. Um, so these were the three modules that I did from my QLOC PD scholarship. I also did two other compulsory modules prior to receiving the QLOC PD scholarship. And then the legislation workshop was the third of three compulsory modules. And the research and information and analytics and working with industry were two elective modules that I chose from a choice of 11 modules. So and this slide shows what we did for each module. So for each module, we did pre, had to do some pre-workshop reading that took about one weekend for each workshop. Then I attended a half day workshop and then we did a multiple choice assessment with 20 questions and we were required to get 75% or more. So 15 questions right to pass the module. After completing all of the modules, the last activity um, I've done and I've just uh, recently completed 
to complete the whole accreditation is a case study. And for the case study, we were given a scenario that was hypothetical, but could easily have been real. And we needed to respond to six of a choice of eight questions, explaining how I would respond to the issues raised in the hypothetical scenario. And this case study was really, really valuable for consolidating and applying all that I'd learnt throughout the program. So, what did I learn about the profession? I learned that ARMS is the association for staff who work in research offices, and so it's analogous with QLOC and CALL for librarians. I also learned that the roles of research administrators are very diverse, and just like librarianship, roles for staff in research offices include research data administration, ethics, commercialization, grants, and legislative compliance. There's many passionate staff working in research administration um, with um, many of them being very active in arms. And um, so I got to see this very strong culture of sharing and networking, which is also just like librarianship. But a major difference from librarianship is that there's no single research administration qualification and most learning is done on the job, which is why the arms programs are so important. So I found the formal training through my, the modules really useful. I, over the past 12 years as a librarian and as a researcher before this, I've developed quite a lot of knowledge about research administration. But what the program did was bring all these fragments of knowledge together into a logical consolidated order. And one example is university rankings and the metrics used in these rankings including details about why different rankings suit different universities based on their size and priorities. The program also identified and then filled gaps in my knowledge. And hearing the personal stories from so many different universities also gave me valuable insights to the work of research administration, despite me never having worked in a research office. I was really pleased with how welcome I was as a librarian in the workshops. ARMS clearly recognises and values what we can contribute, but sadly I was the only librarian at the legislation and the working with industry workshops. And so my most important personal takeaway is that I'd really like to see more librarians be more involved with ARMS. <coughs> How has the ARMS modules had an impact on my day-to-day -day work? Well, firstly, it's helped me with settling into my new job at Southern Cross University. What I've learned has given me greater insight to the roles of staff I've met in our research office and what their jobs involve. It also helped me to kick off more meaningful conversations. And it gave me an instant connection with the executive officer to our DBC for research who's doing the advanced level arms accreditation program. Uh, I also now have a greater appreciation of the different drivers for research management. A driver is a term that was used quite often in the program. <coughs> and we learn about how the drivers differ at each staffing level. For example, at the university senior management level, an important driver is reputation. Well, compliance is an important driver for research administration. And the drivers uh, for researchers include things like passion, curiosity, job security. Being aware of these different drivers is useful for helping me to think about how to pitch conversations with these different audiences. So for the applications in my library, I see immediate ongoing applications as well as some potential applications. There's already a good relationship between the library and our Office of Research and I've been able to build on and contribute to this relationship using what I've learned in the program. And within our library I've been sharing what I've learned with the liaison librarians and repository staff. Um, so I also think um, looking to the future that Learning about another profession can be useful for reflecting on how we work in libraries. Uh, 
So um, I think that libraries might be able to learn from the engagement and impact conversation that's happening at our universities at the moment. And this idea was first prompted for me when I read a report by Megan Oakleaf titled The Value of Academic Libraries. And there's a reason why I selected the working with industry as one of my elective modules. Topics covered in this module, which had me thinking about how we do things in libraries included why engagement is important, practical approaches to partnering and implementing partnerships, and also the difference between engage and engagement and impact and why it is important to assess impact. <clears throat> so the applications for QLOC overlap with what I have explained in the previous slide for the applications in my library. I think that the main application for QLOC is that I would now like to encourage other staff from QLOC member libraries to get involved with the ARMS activities. I highly recommend that where possible librarians who support, um, provide support for research or researchers get involved with ARMS. And um, so there's, uh, ARMS offers 14 modules in the foundation program and you can do just selected modules and there was definitely people in the workshops who were just doing selected modules because that was the topic that they, the area they were working in and wanted to know more about that or wanted to move into that area. But you could also do the foundation level accreditation program, the entire program, um, which comprises three compulsory modules, two modules of your choice, and then the case study. And so doing the modules will build on your existing knowledge or can fast track your learning if you are new to library research support. And so lastly, just to make sure you know that ARMS has corporate memberships for, like for our universities and that enables all employees of ARMS member organisations, not just research administrators, to do the modules or to do the whole program at a subsidised rate. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has a question for Jackie, just use the chat. Um, the, the chat option um, can also use the Q&A if you can see that as well. Um, so I will, when I share the link to the recording, I'll also share um, Jackie's um, PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, and again, Jackie's very easy to find at Summer Cross Uni if you have a, a, a bigger question or a question you think of later. Um, here we go. Can you see the question, Jackie? Because I can read it. Yep. I've got it, thanks. Great. Yeah. Um, so Sam's asked, I was wondering if there was something that you could share an example of, something you, you did not know before that you learnt through the modules. Um, uh, I guess the legislation one comes to mind first of all and that was particularly interesting because I now feel better equipped to support our law students. I, um, one of the things that I really liked was we learned about a pyramid where, and I'd need to look at it to remind myself exactly, but basically that um, at the top of the pyramid is um, the axe and then it, um, working down through the pyramid there's less um, legislative requirements or um, it's less rigid. Um, so um, moving down to legislation that's managed um, at the state level and the territory level and then within our universities. And so, um, uh, uh, and also like the codes of practice, the research responsible um, code for, um, um, what is it? The, um, Code for Responsible Conduct of Research. That is an example where it's not a legal document, but um, it sort of feeds up into the legal document. So there is legal implications. So yeah, I learned a lot in the legislation workshop. The research data and analytics workshop um, 
it was nice in that it made me realise how much I already knew, um, but filled in some gaps. And, you know, I've read a lot about university rankings, but I really like the way they spelt out the, um, the differences, you know, which metrics are used in each one. Um, and um, what was the other one that I... Um, uh, I can't think what the th oh yeah um, of course working with industry so that was great in that we learned really practical things about building relationships and they, we had a few um, forms that we could use a template for documenting impact and keeping track um, yeah so a very applied kind of discussion there um, so yeah I absolutely re recommend that you get involved if if it, um, sounds like it'll be useful. <clears throat> Great, thank you both. And uh, any other questions for Jackie? While well, she's still online. So again, another um, uh, a fairly different type of PD um, uh, this time round. Rachel, maybe I could just make a comment that I was thinking both Sam and I have tapped into new audiences with the activities that we've done. And so that's a great benefit that QLOC has um, supported us to do. And um, I think we've raised the profile of libraries and what libraries can contribute to other discussions happening at our unit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, I think that's it in terms of questions. Uh, I just want to thank both of you very much for it. Uh, you not only um, make an application, but you then have to do the PD and then you have to do numerous um, types of reporting, including this webinar. So we really appreciate um, all the time that goes into that and, and also um, articles for the QLOC news <laughs> coming soon. Um, so yes, uh, so on behalf of the um, Workforce and Organisational Development Working Party who organised these um, webinars for the recipients, um, thank you both very much and I will send links and, and whatnot to uh, the whole of QLOC and beyond. Thanks Rachel. Thank no you. problem. No problem. Thank you, everybody.